Well, I think the theme was antiquities. So um, I decided to take you all at um, your word. So I've unpacked a filing cabinet I have at work um, that's got some antiquities in it. So I'll start with a nice carved figure. Can you see that? I don't know, it's maybe too dark in the background, um, but it's a carved wood figure of um, one assumes uh, mother and or father and child um, carved. It's oak um, and it's slightly gilded. I don't know if you can see reflections and gilding on it round about where the hair is on this figure here, um, but it's medieval. Um, probably something that once was in a church, a simple little church, um, and uh, I think it's supposed to represent uh, Joseph and the infant Jesus, um, as opposed to Mary. But a nice little carved wood figure. I bought it years ago. You can see the gilding maybe there a little bit better in the wood. Um, and when something's been gilded, it's been something that's been special, especially then, because, of course, gold was the currency and also a precious metal and um, quite expensive, well, rare and expensive, although some was mined in um, Britain, but a lot of it came from Europe. Um, so anything that was gilded, it was hammered out into sheet metal and applied as it is today, the simple sort of way. But it's really nicely carved, considering they didn't have the tools that we have later. But, um, uh, you know, it's what size is it? It's that sort of size. So it's about eight inches, something like that. Um, and uh, I've always liked carved wood figures. So this one, which came from France, we had an executory. Um, and everything was shipped over from France. Um, and this was one of the things that was uncovered in the shipment. And it's a Franciscan monk. Um, and he's probably somewhere around about 1620, 1630, something like that. Um, nice early figure. He's been painted and also gilded at various times. You can see his bald head. Um, and his face is quite simply carved. Um, in the sort of round, you see him got ears, um, there's traces of colour where his hair was. Um, and obviously you can see he's got his belt with the, the tie, a book. And I think here originally you can see there's a gap. It would have had like a little taper candle that would have possibly sat um, inside this part. Um, he's got a little stand, which is at home. I didn't bring him in. But um, as you can see, he is really old. Um, the wood just had the odd little split, as you'd expect. But again, he's about 10 inches tall, something like that. Um, and these things have become quite collectible. They weren't quite so collectible 25 years ago when I bought them, but um, they certainly have become a lot more desirable and things these days. Um, and I'm taking them, I think, back to France. We've got a house in France. I think he's going to stay there because um, I think that's he should return home in some way. I know. <laughs> Um, there's, I brought a collection of Egypt, Egyptian items. Um, these are the sort of things that were buried with people in their tombs or wrapped in their bandages if they were mummified um, in their sarcophaguses and they were supposed to travel with them to the um, other world and uh, have the sort of blessings of the gods. And this is Osiris and there's quite a few of them. I don't know if they all came from the same tomb but um, they're different sizes. These are bronze, and I presume they're sort of Middle Kingdom um, by the style. There's one or two things that are a little bit more. This is a bigger one. This one's again in bronze. Um, he's had some gilding at one point on him as well, um, but that's obviously come off with age. But he's actually really, I don't know if you can see the detail on him. He's actually really nicely cast. It's a really good casting. It's also been polished off and finished. Um, you know, and that's, that's the other one isn't, it's much rougher on the back. If you compare the two, I'll try and get them in the camera so you can see them. This one is definitely not as well finished as this one here. It's much better quality and obviously possibly would have sat outside the tomb uh, or in the tomb rather, but in a separate thing or a shelf or something or resting on the floor. Um, so the two of them different in size. Um, but that one's really nice. It's got uh, little marks on the back. Um, and then also there's another one which is smaller. This would definitely been wrapped up 
in the bandages on the sarcophagus. You can see he's really tiny. You know, that's my finger. So he's really small. Um, and they would have been bound in the bandages as well when they were buried. Um, and I think sometimes when they were dug up, these weren't as, as valuable at the time. They were looking for gold and silver and other precious um, gems and things. So often these would be looted, but these things would be discarded. But I think in the 19th century, sort of grand tour time, if you could get something like this, you know, it showed you were a man of intellect, you traveled, you were knowledgeable and you appreciated the arts. So um, I think these became a little bit more desirable. And certainly in the twenties and thirties, these things were turning up quite regularly. Um, and then here I've got another one, which is again Osiris, but as a serpent this time, and you can see him in much more sort of detail. And the bronze has obviously been somewhere where there's been some moisture because you've got some discoloration there on the bronze as well where the coppers come through. Um, he's got a little panels that are enameled in the front. Um, but obviously, again, over time, um, these have become discolored, um, just probably oxidized like the bronze. But um, I think this one, again, would probably have been somewhere wrapped up um, or might have been included in the mummy's case. Um, and again, I, I think he's Middle Kingdom. Sticking with the Egyptians, I've got, I've got, come well, I don't know if I've got all of them with me. Um, Ushapti, again, this one is glazed in turquoise. Again, these were sometimes wrapped actually with the mummies or placed in the sarcophagus. They're quite, I've had oh, about maybe five or six over the years. What's this one's got something, somebody's written on the foot. Um, Ushapti, um, yeah. And it's actually quite nice. Some of them have much more clear or distinguished hieroglyphs on the center panel, which is probably a prayer. Um, but he's actually not in bad condition. Um, I mean, these aren't expensive. I think you can usually pick them up for some between 50 and 100 pounds. So in terms of their age, they're not of huge, immense value. Um, but I've always liked them. So sometimes I've given them to people as Christmas presents to put on. <laughs> um, you know, they unwrap it and they get a surprise when they see a little mini mummy. Um, <laughs> um, and this, again, this, I think, is Middle Eastern. I think it's from what would probably be uh, Jordan these days or Syria. Um, it's a glazed cat. Um, again, the Egyptians did have cats as well and worshipped them, so it could be from that sort of Egypt as well. It's got holes in the top of its head. I don't know if you can see there. Um, and I think that would be for possibly incense, little incense sticks um, to burn because, of course, they burn incense as well. Some of the glazing has unfortunately come off the little cat, but glazing of that period, you needed really, really high temperatures and you needed a very, very careful um, kiln master to make sure that um, the charcoal that you had to burn didn't mix in with the glaze. Otherwise, it would have turned out really dark. You've got black painting on it as well so for it to settle um, I mean this is molten glass so it's 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 quite something to think that this is probably something like oh getting on for 2,000 years old um, you know and in Britain we didn't even have wood, uh, china plates or pottery plates we were drink, eating and drinking out of wooden bowls if you were lucky so it's quite amazing and something from that age has, has lasted um, I've also got <laughs> it's only the feet I don't know what happened to the rest of it um, when I bought this this was all there was um, a little wooden base with a pair of I presume it would be a, an, an Egyptian figure possibly the person buried in the tomb a sort of miniature of them um, to go to the other world and uh, but on block but really nicely painted as you can see I mean the toes are there and you can clearly distinguish and see them again you know this is probably couple of thousand years old. So the fact it survived even that long is quite a miracle. It's not everything does, obviously. Here we've got uh, amphora, a little amphora. This one is Roman. Um, it's, what, it's about six inches tall. It's heavily um, calcified. I think this has been in water and has been taken out of the sea, hence the calcification. It is um, made of clay, so it's amazing it survived. Probably the fact it's calcified has meant that it has survived. It's given it an out, a tougher outer shell. But this would probably have maybe uh, rose water or a, 
a scented oil or something in it because it would probably be for personal use as opposed to the ones that contain wine. I don't know if any of you have ever been to uh, Pompeii and seen the ruins there where, you know, the jars are sort of like six feet high plus some of them. Um, so this is just a little mini one that would have a stand, a metal stand it would sit on and support here um, because obviously it would just roll off if you put it on its side. But um, again, it's one of those sort of little things that turned up and I thought, oh my goodness, in a box, I'll have to buy that. That looks really interesting. And again, it wasn't a huge amount of money, um, something like 40 pounds a long time ago. Um, then here again, I've got a Roman cruzy lamp. Um, they had oil in them and they would um, have a little wick here and it would burn slowly. Um, as you can see by the back, it's obviously been somewhere sitting where it's been <laughs> got a bit dirty. Um, this one would be a portable one, so you could carry it around, obviously. Um, I suppose what they would be equivalent of a chamber candlestick in the Roman times. This is probably about a uh, turn of the sort of uh, into AD, I would have thought, maybe 100 AD or something by the style of it. Um, it's a really nice little one. It's got a tiny little chip there, but it's in very good condition. Um, there's a, where a lot of fakes, but the, this one isn't. Um, the darkness of the underside and the use of it tells you that it's been used a lot, which is really nice. Next, this is Egyptian. Um, it's a piece of pottery, again, with a lovely, amazing blue glaze. It's quite thickly potted. It would have been a, uh, an oval vase, maybe with a your handle at the side. Um, and just loosely decorated with a quite striking design. Um, this is supposed to be from the uh, 18th dynasty, um, about 1700 BC. So it's quite old. Um, it probably would have been one of the first things to get its jab um, because of its age. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's amazing that, again, it survived. But these would be, again, probably damaged when people raided tombs. Uh, I had a, a canoptic vase for about 10 years, but uh, I decided to sell it. I can't remember exactly why, um, but it had um, a fox's head on the top and was made of alabaster um, rather than china. I mean, again, this could have been containing in, uh, sort of innards, you know, when they mummified, you know, they took your organs out and placed them in different vases and things. And often sometimes these were coloured as well, not just in canoptic ones. So uh, it could have been holding something inside. It's also got a glazed inside too, but it's lovely. Well, I like it personally. Again, we've got a little Roman vase, a pottery one here. Again, in pretty good condition. Again, this is probably at least over a thousand years old. Um, and they're often usually <laughs> damaged or they've got cracks, but this one hasn't. It's got a sort of what I would call a uh, bronzed finish to it. It's got a glaze, which is a sort of dark brownish uh, blue color. Um, not very big, probably again for containing ointments or something like that, um, because usually they would be for personal use at this size, but it's a really nice little one. It's got a slight chip to the top. Again, this was about 50 pounds, so not a lot of money. Here I have got a little Roman head, a little pottery Roman head. Um, this probably would be in a, maybe a little shrine or something and people would uh, make offerings to it. It could be a family member. Um, it's got a museum number on the back, but I don't know which museum <laughs> it came from. It certainly wasn't one in Edinburgh, um, but often these things were dug up, I presume in digs and um, given a number for cataloging and then kept. Um, it came from a big house up in Fife um, and turned up in a drawer and they had no idea where it came from. It's hollow at the back, so it probably would have sat on something or been a peg on the wall or something uh, to keep it upright. Um, but it's really nice. It's not been uh, decorated in any shape or form. You can see it's just the actual discolouring of the clay. Um, but she's nice. Um, and you can tell obviously it's a she by her hair. Um, I don't know if any of you have had the Vatican tour and the pleasure of it, but it is fascinating what they have there. The collection is unbelievably huge. I mean, unbelievably huge. This, again, is um, 
I think, Egyptian, and it's supposed to be a cat. Um, again, I think it would be something that would be a little worshipping uh, sort of thing that we'd sit on an altar and people would make offerings to it. Uh, it's cast in bronze. It's very rudimentary. As you can see, it's simple. It's rudimentary. It's got this little front. Um, but it's, again, been dug up from the ground. It turned up again in a house in Edinburgh many, many years ago. Um, and I just thought, oh, it's interesting. It's definitely, everybody thought it was just uh, modern, but it's not. I reckon it's Bronze Age, um, at least. Um, and then on to other things. A little Buddhist shrine sort of thing that you'd find in um, North India. Um, a little temple shrine, which you'd have in your home and you would make offerings to. It's um, carved out of uh, red sandstone um, and hollowed out, as you can see from the back. Um, but this to take me to do as well. Uh, I've got a couple of these that I bought that turned up. Um, I just think they're really nice and they kind of maybe bring your home. Um, good wishes and stuff. So it's what we call a, a Buddhist. I was sitting on his little lotus leaf flower there and stand, and you've got temples at the side. So again, probably something like 15th century, I would imagine, judging by the style. Um, quite simple. Um, it's not been gilded. It's obviously for home use, um, but a simple thing. Um, and continuing with the Eastern theme, this came in the other day. It's a carved wood figure of, uh, I suppose, not an immortal, but he would be a um, soldier or a warrior or chieftain. He's Chinese. He's on a throne seat, as you can see at the back, which means he's somebody of power and standing because they were the only ones that were allowed to have them. Um, as mere mortals were not they didn't fit to do them. They had to stand or sit on the floor. Um, they were not allowed to sit on a seat. Um, it's a nice carved wood. He's probably Ming in terms of date. So somewhere between sort of like 1600 to about 1720 um, in terms of date. So a good few hundred years old, if you think about it, sort of three or 400 years old. Um, and again, these sorts of things would sometimes be um, put in a little family shrine and they would be worshipped. People would make offerings and um, incense and stuff to them. Um, he's lost a leg. And as you can see, they were made in sections and then joined together quite often. That's quite typical. Same with ceramics, the same way. Um, I think, I oh, see he had something in his hand. Yes, he will have had possibly a rue or a staff in his hand. You can see there's a hole. I don't know if you can see the hole at the top. Um, but he's carved in what we call the round, which is really nice because often they're just carved as a flat back. So you don't really see them very clearly. So he's really nice. Really, really nice. Um, sticking with the Chinese theme. A little carved head, again, from a, a figure, um, probably a courtier, a model of a courtier carved out of wood, as you can see. It's got a hole in the top where, where the peg went through. Um, it's been painted with chalk and then red, which have been crowned um, nut, beetle nuts uh, to make the red for its lips and uh, markings and then sort of black ochre for its head. Um, but a really nice little figure. Like I say, the Chinese were often quite keen on making uh, figures of their family and again, worshipping your ancestors. So. Often that's what these were for. And again, he's probably sort of uh, 15, no, 1600, 1650, something like that. Unfortunately, I don't have the rest of them. But I do have a Chinese, you won't be able to see it all so clearly in the rounds, but a Chinese Ming roof tile, um, which I bought many years ago. You can see it's been on the top of a roof. Uh, some of them are at the end and some of them are at the top and the corners, uh, often you get dragons and things. I've got a carved dragon at home, but um, he's too heavy to come in and he's about um, a foot tall. Um, and he's made out of stone, but she's beautifully decorated. Um, 
she's got her lily, water lily there, which she's holding. Um, her head has been restored, unfortunately. You can see at the back. Um, she's, her head was knocked off, but kept, most importantly. And again, grazed, glazed in what you would typically see, this green colour, which is typical of the Ming period, with the ochre, which is down below. Um, and actually, considering this would just be sitting on a tile and really not observed, it's incredibly detailed. You know, she has her features. You can see where her hair was, um, the folds of her robe and things. Um, and obviously, she's mounted. The stand is about 1900, 1920, but she's much earlier, much. So she's a Ming roof tile from quite a grand building. It might have been an official building in... Um, Beijing or some of one of the other bigger cities. Um, I'm not quite sure, but um, really nice. She's actually very heavy as well. Continuing with a bit of Oriental, years ago, I came across this in a sale and um, I thought it's just, it's a teapot. That's where the spout would be here. You can see where it's been perforated. It's quite large. If you look at the size of my hands, it's like a large Victorian, what we think of as a Victorian one. But this is about 1680, 1700. And that's where the handle would have been. It's got two holes there. They were always applied separately at the time and molded onto the body. This would be cast as one thing. You can see inside the rings where it's been potted and then it's been painted outside. Um, there's probably been about four firings to make this. Um, but here, which is the thing that really intrigued me, uh, I'll try and get it so you can see, there's a man with glasses. Because um, the Chinese had glasses quite early on. Even in Marco Polo's time, they had glasses. Um, so if you look at it, you can see this guy peering with a pair of glasses. This was meant for the Western market or Eastern, um, you know, either Europe or the UK. Ended up in the UK when I bought it. But it may have started off being for the, because they do look a little... European, the figures, they're not necessarily what we would call Chinese. Um, and obviously that one has got winter clothing on, he's got a mink collar and mink cuffs. So this is probably from the winter time. Um, and they actually look like traders. If you look at that chap there, and there's boats in the background suggesting trade as well. Again, a bit like the Elizabethans use these things as symbols. Um, and you know, this was a luxury item, A, because it was for tea and a lot of tea, uh, meant for the Western market, um, and also the fact it's so highly decorated, um, but beautifully done. I mean, really, really nice. It's a pity the handle and the spout didn't survive, um, but certainly they weren't in any drawer or any cupboard in the house. But again, beautifully enameled. You know, the work involved in that is like a miniature painting, so a real quality piece. It also has the original lid, which you can see there, and the actual top is gilded as well, and it's not been off. But the buildings in the background in that little vignette look quite European too. Um, you know, they've not got Chinese, well, Chinese style roofs. Um, this one, again, you've got figures on a landscape with boats. So beautifully done. Um, and it's got the same, what we call running dog border here. Um, some we call it Greek key pattern, but it's running dog when it's the Far East. Um, and that's on the teapot as well. And this is just a piece to compare. A lady brought this in recently. Um, and as you can see, it's a tea bowl. Um, but if you look at the gilding of that, oops, gilding of that piece, which is lovely. It's what we call water gilded. And then you look at the inside of the bowl. It's kind of dusty and it's a bit, it looks like it's been painted on with a brush as opposed to laid on and then fired into the clay. Um, it just doesn't look as bright as you'd expect. And again, in the bottom, it kind of looks a bit powdery, doesn't it? I think you can also hopefully see it, the seal mark. This is called Dakai, Dakai, Dakai the pattern here with this green um, terracotta and uh, yellow. It's got a little dragon chasing the Pearl of Wisdom which is there, symbolized by that. Um, and the character marks make it sort of, I think it's supposed to be 1780, but actually it's more like 1900, I reckon, in terms of date. Um, but the quality of painting, I mean, it's a T-bowl, so you can get, is nothing like the designs and patterns of these. You know, it's much cruder. 
Uh, then next here, I've got, it's actually, it looks, if you look at this, it looks to be like cinnabar or carved. It's got a texture, a pattern. You know how chefs are always on about the texture of your food and, and the design and the way it's all laid out. Well, this is a textured vase. It's actually ceramic. You can see on the bottom, it's white. It's not wooden. It's not lacquer. It's actually ceramic. And it's been carved while the, uh, the porcelain was soft. And you can see you've got uh, fronds here, which have what looks like bergenvilla. You've got butterflies. You've got chrysanthemums. And you've got a beautiful bird. I don't know if you can see that clearly enough. Um, again, all carved out of the ceramic when it was still soft or relatively soft. So it's very crisp and textured. It's been inlaid as well, which you maybe can see on the leaf there, if I get it at the right angle. There's actually brass wire inlaid into them um, and to around certain flowers and leaves um, to highlight them. Um, which is really unusual. I've never seen anything like it, um, but a huge amount of work. And again, at the bottom, you can see where there's leaves and there's the bird, and you can see the wire that's laid into the carved ceramic. Richard, can you come and do a bit of a recording of me talking, please, as well? Susan wanted to post something on your phone later. Yeah. Um, so it's it's quite beautiful in terms of the way it's designed and laid and the butterfly i think you can maybe there as you can see is absolutely lovely that somebody can carve that out of ceramic a, a soft pit well a hard paste porcelain another thing which i'm never quite sure what it is i think it's a sharpening stone um it's i think bronze age it's very, very beautifully rounded. It's got a flat tablet on both sides, as you can see, um, but it's quite heavily pitted. And I think it's been a sharpening stone for a soldier um, that they would take with them. It could be Bronze Age, it could be Roman. I'm not quite sure, but I know the Romans traveled. Again, they would have a pouch with a sharpening stone to make sure their swords were sharp. And it's the sort of thing that I'm sure, like I say, would sharpen a blade because it's been roughed. Um, it feels, it's very cold. It never seems to get warm. Um, and it's definitely got signs of a blade being scored across it. I don't know if you can see the pitting as well. But it's lovely. It's very tactile. It's like a piece of jade or a, oops, morning, Bruce. Yes. A piece of um, something that you'd want to, no, not that stroke the way it's, shaped and molded around there it's very tactile which is really nice onto bronzy things again i've got a pair which is really <laughs> rare of little roman bronze vases um two handled ones again this they might be bottom <laughs> Um, film. Um, they're an identical pair. These would be cast from a mould. Um, that one has obviously been filled more than this one. Um, but you can see again the fact that they've been out in the air and they've oxidised over the years. Um, but they're in lovely condition. And bronze is one of the few things that does survive. Um, you do get pieces of brass or small bits of brass. I don't think they've been decorated. Um, there's no sign of anything on them. I think they would have just been patinated bronze, little miniature vases, but definitely Roman in period. And I'm sure Richard would say agree because he was Roman? Roman. Yes, Roman. He's agreeing. And he's he used to work in Sotheby's, New York. <laughs> and he was um, uh, bronzes. Arms and armor. Um, so he, if he says it's right, it's right. Um, and here I've got something more modern as well. This is coming up in sale on the sixth uh, of March. It's a lovely little Anglo-Indian box. 
uh, probably for pills or something for the Western market, circa sort of 1900. Um, you can see it's got a little miniature mogul painting on it. We'll get the reflection off it. You can see it. It's I mean, it's really small, but beautifully done. Again, it's of a uh, prince, a princess, a princess actually, I think she is. Um, there you go. And it beautifully chased and finished inside. You can see the border there is lovely, all decorated in a scrolling, sort of, I suppose, paisley design with a molded edge, beautifully fitted in. And again, the glass is fitted actually into the rim in a lovely way, but real quality, really, really, really amazing quality. The other thing, <laughs> this used to belong, <laughs> belong to a friend. <laughs> I can hold his jaw together. There you go. Um, it, yeah, it is a real human skull, um, which sits on the desk um, beside me. Um, and it came from a chap called Romley Squires, as uh, estate. He was a really good friend. Um, this isn't his skull, I have to say. This is much older. Um, I think <laughs> his family and friends would be horrified of him, his skull beside me. But um, he kept it on his desk as well. So I always uh, keep it on mine. And... Um, he was somebody that uh, loved history. He um, researched history for people and family trees. He was also very involved in a lot of historical recreation uh, societies where they had battles and things um, and liked to dress up in, uh, I suppose it would be as cavalier. I think he was a cavalier. Um, anyway, so this used to sit on his desk where um, I've had so many people ask to buy him and recently, um, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Mrs. McTaggart, as in her husband was the, one of the, he was the nephew of McTaggart, the painter, um, and his father had been a doctor. And uh, there was a skull in a top hat, which I got from her, and uh, we sold it and it went to Sweden, um, and it cost 800 pounds for the skull. Um, his was more of a medical one and not as old as this. Um, this one, I think, is probably 19th century. Um, I, I mean, I suppose, again, dug out possibly for medical science purposes. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but I've been told by the teeth, that's about when it is. Um, he's lost a few teeth. We have another one, which I can't bring through to you yet. But um, it's much earlier. I think we reckon it's medieval. Yeah. Medieval. And it's got really good teeth for its age. The guy's about maybe 30 or 40. But he's got all his teeth. And apparently that's the way you tell... If it was in the 19th century, they tended to have had a lot of sugar from the sort of middle of the 18th century onwards. So therefore, their teeth were more likely to fall out and rot um, or be pulled out and extracted. Um, but he's lost definitely a few teeth to, um, I would say, sugar. So I hope this has been a little bit interesting for you because I think you've got possibly questions you want to answer me. So or you can speak to my friend here. <laughs>